It's episode six of The Amiga Show. Coming up, we take a look at Aegis images and try our hand at animation. We browse through the magazine rack of April 86. I attempt to play Psygnosis' first game, as well as a newly discovered classic. Now with 40% more drop shadow, it's The Amiga Show. Okay, let's get up to speed on this one. If you cast your mind back to episode one, we looked at Graphicraft. Shortly after it was released, the software moved to Island Graphics, which became the basis of Aegis Images. Around that time, Animator was ported from Atari, and the two were bundled together. And here it is, still in its 1986 shrink wrap which is, of course, of no use to anybody, so let's take a look inside. Now, I absolutely love the box art. This could not be any more 80s if it was strapped to a filofax. On the back, uh, we are promised all sorts of sophisticated painting and animation features. Inside we get two manuals one for images, and one for animator. As I uh, tear open the software envelope, there is my registration card, which obviously I'll need to send off. But only one disc. I'm assuming this was a cost reduction for the bundle. Interestingly, with a 1985 copyright and the name Bob Jacobs, who no doubt we'll hear more about in future episodes as the man behind CinemaWare. Anyway, let's boot this up. As we go into images, we are presented with a fast menu, essentially a shortcut to palette, various brushes and a function history. Anyway, I'll write a little hello uh, and it draws pretty much as you'd expect. Going across the menus though, you quickly realise that this is a very feature-rich application with many more tools than Deluxe Paint's first outing. Just to show you, I'll change the brush to a larger one and write something similarly useful. Now, Images comes with anti-aliasing from Word Go. You can see here as I draw, the edges are automatically smoothed out. Very cool. Um, if only I could draw this line for you. <laughs> oh well. You can also paint with textures. Uh, these can be edited or designed from areas of the screen, useful for making backgrounds. Here's an example of me using the spray can to paint with this texture. You can just as easily create, say for example, a shaded circle, define that area, and then either paint or fill with it. It has a nice set of curved drawing tools which can be used with a repeat function, giving a cool spirograph type effect. When combined with color cycling, they can be really quite effective and of course animated. Now, although there are not many images on the disc, this lotus flower is quite nice and useful to play around with. Unlike D-Paint's brush function, Images has windows, a sort of 
hand-me-down from frames in Graphicraft. The window can be cut and pasted, much like in D-Paint, but the UI also allows for quick access to scale and rotate functions. There's also a cool set of images that allow you to produce this scene. Having loaded in the background, these windows can then be loaded in a similar manner to D-Paint's brushes. The standalone version of images also included some nice pictures by John Sachs. Now let's flip over to Animator. This program has an impressive list of features hidden behind these uh, slightly chaotic icons, but impressive for what was the first piece of animation software for the Amiga. I decided to use the manual's tutorial uh, as a way to get into this rather bizarre animation system. Now, shapes or polygons can be created, moved, scaled and rotated. The positions are set as tweens, uh, basically a start and end state. Multiple tweens can then be chained together to produce an animation. This is different to, say, keyframing, which became more common in later applications, and it took me a while to get my head around it at first. The disc has a couple of neat examples, though, one of which is a spinning logo made of polygons, and the other a nice animation using window elements, which can also be loaded in. Uh, the music is just for effect, but well, it's pretty nice. So that got me thinking. I rendered a version of the Amiga Show logo in ham mode, that's the Amiga's 4096 color mode, which I then converted to 32 colors to load into images. I then split the elements out and saved them as separate windows. Flipping back over to animate, I made a series of polygons that went over the logo. I could create one and then use the clone tool to create the others. Then it was just a case of colouring each one with the correct colour from the palette to match the logo. Ah, that's close enough. Having got this wrong a few times, which I will spare you, I decided to save. As these objects are now all selected, they can be moved and animated in one go. So I'm going to build up an animation a bit like that. So now I'm clearing away the logo and loading in the individual parts I saved out into images. Um, I put them down roughly in the right place. The then Amiga. And then show. Selection is done by proximity. So you don't always have to be completely accurate in your selection. Though this can mean that you can grab the wrong thing. Fortunately, there is one undo for such a moment. So I want to move all of the windows out of frame. As everything is currently selected, I can use out to zoom the polygons towards us. Now the bitmaps do not scale, but all the objects are still locked together in the same plane. Uh, I'm just moving the objects to get a nice travel through these squares. And then clicking on the camera to play. 
Now that's the first bit done, not too bad, and no rendering required of course. Now I want to bring everything back in, which requires a bit of guesswork. By selecting everything, I switch the tool to in and hope that when I drag, everything comes back. Which it mostly does. I now have to find the missing bitmaps and drag them into place. As well as deleting this rogue polygon I'd obviously missed. Now, using the time menu, you can flick between tween states, which allows me to get a closer match on the logo position. Now, the top line just needs a bit of tweaking so I can bring that in a bit. And I think that'll be. Uh, close enough for this attempt. So let's play it back. And there it is. I think that would have looked pretty good in 1986. Maybe all that's left to do is genlock it over a background or something like that. It's an interesting set of tools. Uh, both programs complement themselves quite well. Images, although packed with features, lacks deluxe paints effortless user interface. Animator had no competitors at this point, and whilst clearly innovative, a quirky interface and lack of export functions kept this program from truly taking off. That pun is part of a collection, the next one will be included free on the cover of next month's episode. and a segue as well. It's April 1986. Byte magazine has gone for a cracking cover this month because of the nutcrackers on the front. Never mind. Now, if a man stares at you like this whilst holding a glowing five and a quarter inch floppy, it's time to move on. But not before we finally get to read Byte's Amiga versus Atari comparison. They report on Commodore's no show at Comdex but that only seems to have drummed up even more excitement. The magazine states that both machines would eat apple for breakfast, but would that message get out? Interestingly, the ST was nearly going to run Windows, but due to time constraints, switched to GEM, which irritated Microsoft no end. So the magazine asserted that we'd be more likely to see Excel on the Amiga before it ever happens on the ST. Let's not hold our breath. The article is pretty balanced, and while saying that although he preferred the Amiga, exactly how much does he prefer it? A reference to the huge difference in price. Well, maybe PCW has some encouraging news, at least for the US. Whilst Apple brush off the ST and Amiga threat saying, the future of mainstream computing lay in two architectures, the IBM PC and the Macintosh, what do they know? Commodore has begun a special promotion in the States, effectively knocking $500 off a bundle with a monitor. Sadly, the UK's 512K introductory machine is still to be launched at £1,500, but for how long? Do you ever get the feeling you're being played? A new graphical adventure called The Pawn graced the front cover and became the unlikely poster child for the early 16-bit era. Inside, the spread of screenshots from the game quickly convinced me that it was time to move on. I could not believe the graphics. In fact, my friend Matthew and I poured over these very same screenshots at the time. Interestingly, if you actually read the article, the developers are more impressed with the ST than the Amiga. It turns out, though, that artist Jeff Quilly much preferred the ST's paint program he used, as both versions of the game are basically identical, save for the Amiga's amazing loading screen and music, which of course you'll hear in a moment. But it goes to show everyone has their preference, even if they're wrong. As if to prove it, uh, the following page gives an ST versus Amiga rundown, and it's pretty much what you'd expect. The built-in MIDI port versus the Amiga's built-in sound 
graphical and video clout. The magazine is rightly looking forward to both machines. I was looking forward to the Amiga. Amazing Computing issues a battle cry against a Time magazine article which it heavily criticises with the aid of a letter sent by a disgruntled reader. They even suggest holding off reading the Time article if you have a low boiling point. Now, whilst the article in Time may have misinterpreted certain figures, the broad thrust was sound. Commodore had alienated its retail partners and so were looking to sell Amigas through department stores. Once you open your product to mass merchandisers, then you're not selling computers, you're selling toasters. A statement full of irony. Anyway, the Amiga was clearly going to be in for a tough time. Sales figures had been disappointing so far. The article in Amazing Computing is clearly an impassioned response. Maybe they were just wound up after playing Bratticus. The rumours section had some interesting bits though. There were rumblings that a port of Lotus 123 was in the works. This would have been a boost for the Amiga as a business machine. Of course, we would indeed get Lotus 1, 2 and 3, but maybe not quite how they were expecting. There's a little clarity on the Cherry Lane Music Software too, as they decided to leave retail and look to pass their technology on to other developers. EA being the main beneficiary, eventually forming their deluxe and instant music packages. Now, a certain new tech have appeared with a $200 digitizer which can capture images in ham mode. Uh, some remarkable images had been released to the public domain and we'll check those out in a moment. Last but not least, the Amiga gets its first Fred Fish discs. There's just too much to go into about the Fred Fish collection right now, but here are the first 12 discs in what would become a huge curated library. Now, it's time to put the magazine back, take a cheeky glance at the top shelf before quickly walking out, all embarrassed, and we stumble into the gallery. This month features the first published images captured by New Tech's Digiview. Warning, these contain a suggestive use of a lollipop and a pencil. You have been warned. that you've created on the Amiga, why not send them into the gallery? Mail at theamigashow.com You're probably familiar with the tale. UK developer Imagine was producing a new set of mega games along with new hardware to push the ZX Spectrum to its limits. Sadly, it pushed Imagine to its limits and was documented for all to see. Get your foot off the door, please. Thank you. From the ashes of these much-hyped products came Bratticus and a new publisher, Psygnosis. With album-style cover art by Roger Dean, this was the beginning of a long creative association. The game promised much, 
but did it deliver? As we saw in last month's episode, there had already been none too favourable press. Blame had been laid at a hasty Atari ST port, but in truth, that really had nothing to do with it. This unique graphical look came from the Sinclair QL, boasting a 540 by 200 resolution with fixed four color palette. This was the visual hallmark of Sir Clive Sinclair's doomed business machine and was the lead platform for this title, which ultimately never saw a release. But it explains the look. As the game begins, we're treated to some form of music. Well, sort of. Well, they probably meant well. It does get a bit more palatable later on. So here we are, arriving at a spaceport in a small mining asteroid called Bratticus, on the run from Earth for a crime we didn't commit. In an effort to clear your name, we must solve puzzles, pick up clues, talk and fight with local characters. The manual offers little in the way of help, so Kain looks like we're on our own. Armed with nothing but a mouse, our problems were only just beginning. The first being that of control, or lack of it. A technique called implied action has been developed to bring a more gestural control scheme to our character. Moving left or right on the mouse moves the character in the direction they're pointing. The addition of left and right mouse buttons can turn your character, draw a sword or pick up objects. Unfortunately, that can prove clumsy at best and at worst, game breaking. Add to this a buggy WHD load implementation and a modest accelerator, hilarity ensues. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit broken. Uh, to get this game running close to correctly, I would recommend a vanilla 1.3 system, but it's far from bug free and things will slow down to a crawl. Even when all this is done, the simple act of just getting on a lift and staying on a lift can be problematic. Coupled with objects that drop without warning adds to the frustration. Keyboard control can be selected and you'd think this would help, but you would be wrong. Only making matters worse by adding the double pressing of keys for run and walk it really is a mess and it just makes you wonder how badly anyone could ruin up, down, left, right and fire. Now, I know there's a great deal of affection for this game. Uh, if this was the only game you ever had, I can see how the idea of playing an interactive movie, I mean, surely this is one of the first cinematic platformers, was compelling. Striking up a conversation with someone in a bar, getting clues, whilst this world goes on around you, must have been quite unique for the time. Sadly, things get very slow very quickly. Fighting for objects with unresponsive controls, conversations proving unreadable, made this game wholly frustrating and certainly one of the worst games I have ever played. I'm not sure whether to laugh or cry at this one, but after a couple of weeks, I had got nowhere fast. Unfortunately, at six frames per second, even the Lumiere brothers would have given up. No, I do not want to go to the bar, but frankly, I could use a drink after this one. Kine, you really are on your own. Now this game has a bit of history to it. After 25 years in a deep sleep, yes, this game came from the early 90s, Smarty and the Nasty Gluttons finally wakes up and gets a release. And what a complete joy it is, or nightmare.
Having been captured by a stolen dream machine, you and your dog pit your wits against these nasty gluttons to collect keys and free you to the next stage in this smoothly scrolling platformer. Armed with a zapper, you can stun the enemy, rolling them onto each other to collect keys and bonus multipliers. Your hat is available to offer special powers in order to defeat the gluttons. Even your dog Slurpee gets in on the action. The gluttons have three states. Green where they're scared of you, brown where they're more aggressive, and red where they actively chase after you. You can be easily outrun in this state, Shooting them brings them back on state, and the trick is to try and use these states to your advantage. Bonus stages and new levels also bring new challenges, and I can't wait to get further into this tricky but fair game. I really have enjoyed playing this one. It's a very slick arcade experience with lots of care and attention taken over it. Graphics and sound are top notch. In many ways, it's a time capsule. Authentically 90s enemies with their back to front baseball caps, frozen in development until recently being brought back to life. And in a physical box too. Bitmap Soft have done a cracking job on the production of this and comes highly recommended. And that's it for this month's episode. You can help out the show by supporting our Redbubble store or by joining our growing Patreon crew. This month you can expect an exclusive image effects tutorial on the making of our new YouTube thumbnails. Yes, even they are made on the Amiga. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.